All right, guys. The tabernacle. What is a tabernacle? Remind me what that was. What were the different names of the tabernacle? What was the tabernacle? And I know I'm just kind of like jumping in. Um, had different names, right? Um, Structurally speaking, what do we know about the tabernacle? Is it the same as the temple or is it different? Mm, same, but no. Um, so, um, so the temple is more permanent, brick on brick, right? Uh, or stone, stone upon stone, right? The, uh, did you know that the, uh, actually the temple stones that, uh, that Solomon built, I forgot how big they were, but it was about the size of like this, um, about half the, this uh, uh, whiteboard. Uh, so there were m m huge pieces, permanent bricks that they put on top of each other to build the temple. So destroying it was a big feat. Uh, but no, so the, the temple implies more permanence structure right kind of like this church this would be a temple but the tabernacle so backtrack the temple came from the tabernacle right so the tabernacle was that was sometimes called the tent of meeting remember that uh and remember that one video we watched where, where we showed that it was very um it took a lot seven thousand people to dissemble it and then put it back together seven thousand people to like put it all up and move it right um and so it was a tent. Uh, that's what they used to call it. And it was, you can read through Leviticus, the instructions that God gave specifically for the gold plated this and blah, blah, blah. And all of it put together was a big shrine in a way. It could be called a shrine, right? Uh, but later in the days of David, David wanted to build a permanent house for the Lord, right? And we know that from the cultures of the time, the Near Eastern people, Gods had temples. Do we know that? Gods dwell in temples. So even for our Israelite friends, it makes sense for God to dwell in a house built by human hands, right? Later, God says, can I dwell in a house built by human hands? Can a house contain me? We know that God is greater than just a house, right? Uh, what does Paul later talk about the temple? What does he, what does he call the temple? Your bodies, he says, your bodies are the temple of the Lord. So there's been progression between what we understand the temple of, God, of the Lord to be. If you travel in uh, 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 Eastern cultures and in uh, what's called the warm climate culture, so you have like the African cold countries, blah, blah, blah. It's not uncommon to go to a place where you find a some kind of like shrine. It's usually some kind of like hot looking thing. Uh, I don't know how to, I'm not the best at drawing. Um, um, if this is the ground, it looks something like this. These are pegs. And then, I don't know. And then, uh, obviously, that's the entrance. And then, it's common to find things like that or like a hot looking thing um, in the middle of like a forest, right? And in there, people will believe, oh, this is where our gods live. This is where we go to sacrifice um, to our gods. So, um, the idea of a permanence of a God to dwell in a house is not original to the Israelites. It's a lot of cultures who want to have a place where they um, can see and view their God. You remember what I told you before? Why it was easy for the people of God to worship idols? Do you remember? We worship a God unseen, according to John, right? I mean, according to the Bible, obviously. We worship a God who cannot be seen. But for the people in ancient times, if I made a God in the form of this camera tripod, I can worship my God and it makes more sense because I can see my God right here with me. I can carry my God with me in my belongings and take him ever that I go. So it's easier for me to worship something that I see rather than something that I cannot see. So idol worship is very, very easy because of the closeness that it gives, the closeness people feel between themselves and their God. And God comes in and he says, I cannot dwell in idols. These things cannot move. These things have no ears. They cannot hear. I dwell everywhere, right? But then when God gets the Israelites out of the land of uh, Egypt, he wants them to have this symbolic, um, symbolic place where they know they can see that their dwells are God, right? And there's many reasons why we could... Um, um, there's so many reasons why we can give for why God chose to do it this way, right? We can speculate, 
right? We could say, well, but why did God choose to be in a tabernacle? Why did he choose to dwell in a tent, right? If he's everywhere, why did he not just tell them, oh, I'm everywhere, just worship me as I am, right? Uh, but, uh, but then I could also say, well, why did Jesus tell us every time we get together, do Holy Communion? What, what's the symbolism behind why the Lord tells us to break bread together? If I can just remember it, why not just remember it? We as human beings have attachments to physical objects that remind us of, of God. That's just, that's just one explanation of um, why this would make sense. Imagine, like I told you before, people came out of a land of Egypt. They are, they are worshiping foreign gods. And God says, here I am. Great I am. That's the name of the Lord. Here I am, the great I am. I'm giving you a place where in the camp, because they, they were uh, at the time nomads, at the time, if you're in the camp, the Israelite camp, you can lift up your eyes and look and you'll see my house. And maybe when you see my house, it'll cause you to reflect upon me. Maybe if you reflect upon my house and you have an idol in your house that you're hiding, perhaps that will cause you to think, I got to throw my idols out. Okay. Uh, but I want to look specifically at the activities of the temple, uh, not the temple, the uh, tabernacle. It was called the tabernacle. Sometimes it was called the sanctuary, right? So our auditorium is called the sanctuary. Did you know that? What do we call the sanctuary? Place of safe, uh, refuge, right? A place of going into sanctuary in the presence of God, right? Um, not to be confused with sanctuary cities. The Israelites just have sanctuary cities actually, right? Uh, we have sanctuary cities in America, but for immigration purposes, uh, but the Israelites used to have literal sanctuary cities. If I went and killed my friend by accident, I could run to the sanctuary city and I would be protected from uh, punishment, right? Um, obviously not that you should go murder and then run to the next city. Uh, actually, the rules were if you murdered somebody, this in Amarillo, and Lubbock is the sanctuary city, if the deceased family ran up to you and killed you before you got into Lubbock, they would be justified. But if you got into Lubbock, then you're safe. Obviously, there will be some things you'd have to do and all that. But the sanctuary, the tabernacle, um, looked something like this, if you have forgotten. Had an outer, um, <coughs> had an outer, um, uh, I guess, wall, uh, temporary. And then in there, you had these two places, right? Um, that looks like a person, no, I don't like that. Um, and then right here, you have the altar, we're going to call it A, and then the basin of cleaning. And so, holy, holy, the whole sanctuary was holy. Only the Levites could be in the, uh, operate in the tabernacle, right? The altar was where they sacrificed, right? So if I could put it in today's terms, the Levites would be me, Dale, Dewey, because we're ministers. So we would be Levites. Otherwise, we would not be permitted to uh, do our, we, we could not do what we're doing, right? Um, and so people brought their sacrifices and they'll be sacrificed. Yeah, and I want to explain what those sacrifices uh, uh, look like. Uh, what is a sacrifice? What would you term as a sacrifice? Simple terms, simple, simple terms. An offering of some sort, right? You offer something for a reason. There's a reason behind a sacrifice. If I threw my chicken out and I was like, oh, have it, I don't care. That's not a sacrifice. That's just, I guess, generosity. Um, but the sacrifice belonged to the Lord, right? And he graciously gave it to his people so that by it, by faith, they might um, receive divine gifts. So there was a purpose behind a sacrifice. You sacrificed for reasons in order to get something in return. And this is not new to the Israelites. This is, we do sacrifices today. When you offer your giving up at the, uh, when we say, all right, time for giving, that is a sacrifice to the Lord. It's just not called a sacrifice, but that would be categorized as a, as a sacrifice. Now, how many of you guys have ever killed an animal before? 
Let me, let, let me rephrase that. <laughs> I'm not including fun. If you could, and then for fun, uh, put your head down and come see me after this. But who's, <laughs> what, what have you had to kill an animal for? Like, eat it? Yeah? Who's ever killed a, what's the biggest animal you've ever killed? A deer. A deer? Did you run it over? Oh, you shot it, you shot it. Uh, um, I ran over a deer one time. Um, <laughs> let's take the guns out. Who's ever had to hold a knife to an animal and like... You have? What did you kill? Uh, a rabbit. A rabbit? Yeah. yeah, a rabbit. What did you kill, King? A goat. A goat, yeah? Who else has killed some kind of animal? What did you kill, Sam? Does dissecting a frog count as killing? Yes. Uh, did you? What? Did you? I don't think I. I think my was probably already dead. I mean, but yeah. Uh, well, what? I killed lots of bugs. No. Um. Uh, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Um. What have you killed, Howie? Fish. Okay, and, and the turtle. She killed a turtle. Wow. Oh. Oh. <laughs> stay with me, stay with me. So, if you've killed an animal, what does it do? It fights for its life, obviously, right? <coughs> and what happens? The blood comes out. So with the sacrifices, the sacrifice was not a mutilated animal. So if you shot it, that would not count. They didn't have guns, obviously. <laughs> but if you took a bow and arrow and you're like, wow, that would not be that would not be proper sacrifice. Sacrifice required the slicing of the neck. Okay, some of y'all are like, it's, it's, it's normal. I've killed chickens a lot and it's quite bizarre but interesting. Uh, but the sacrifices, we know that from early on, sacrifices began from Genesis. Remember the story that I told you between Cain and Abel? It seemed like Cain and Abel knew that there was this thing called sacrificing to God. Abel sacrificed. An animal, right? While Cain sacrificed fruit. Uh, fruit, uh, uh, fruit, produce, right? From his garden. So a sacrifice could both be an animal and a non-living thing. Remember that, okay? It was two things. Um, that's why you may want to write this down. Um, sacrifices were two main categories. One was bloody. One was not bloody. So your sacrifice of giving to the Lord on Sunday morning where you put your offering in there, that would be considered a non-bloody sacrifice. Make sense? Um, and so the bloody sacrifices were offerings of animals that were ritually slaughtered. Uh, to give you an example, because um, I grew up in a, a multi-faith um, uh, environment, uh, there would be people who had these superstitions about protection and blah, blah, blah. And when I was growing up, maybe this might be in Bali, I bet your dad knows this. Um, some people who didn't have a lot of faith in God believed in kind, all kinds of like um, extra powers to protect them, you know, on top of their faith. And so what they would do uh, before people would embark on a journey, because uh, you, if you've been to Uganda, you know that the roads are something, okay? The roads that y'all travel on are so much better than when we were growing up, right? They were bad, meandering up and down mountains, around, uh, you know, treacherous. And so what people would do, they would say, oh, we're about to go on a journey and we want to be protected. So we want to appease the powers that might be. We might appease, we want, we want to appease the, the gods or whatever. And what they would do, they would get a chicken. They're not, they're not gonna stone it because that would not be a sacrifice. And what they do is slit its throat and then they get the blood and walk around the car sprinkling the blood on the ground around the car and sometimes on the wheels in order to wait off evil spirits in order to also invoke good spirits to give them blessings for a journey does that make any sense sounds very bizarre but this is this is normal for a lot of uh, countries and so ritually the animal had to be cut in a specific way if you got the animal and uh you and your buddy stoned it, you'd actually be mutilating the animal, so that would not be a perfect sacrifice. Anyways, so the types of animals that were uh, sacrificed before God, if you read through Le Leviticus and Do uh, Exodus, were mostly were only domesticated animals. 
So you wouldn't bring a warthog, you wouldn't go bring an elephant, you wouldn't go uh, bring your, I don't know, deer. Um, it was always bulls, which is uh, male cows, and then cows, heifers, that's a young one of a, of a cow, right? Um, and then oxen, they all belong in the same animal, in the same <laughs> category, actually. Um, they're all bovines. Um, so they were mostly domesticated animals, right? And then we had sheep. <coughs> Who remind, what's the connection there? Sheep, who's usually referred to as the lamb? Jesus, right? Um, and then there was he goats, she goats, ewes, rams, and lambs. And then we had birds, turtle doves, and pigeons. And then unbloody sacrifices, which were non-living things, we was mostly agricultural produce from the people of God. So that's so Cain sacrifice would fall into that category. And you would be like barley and wheat and olive oil and wine. Okay? And these were this will make sense in a minute. Uh, those, the bloody and the unbloody sacrifices were offered sometimes uh, simultaneously. They were offered at the same times. Let's see, where's my map? <clears throat> no. That makes sense? Sacrificed at the same time. I lost. I mean, how would they, how would they sacrifice things that were not animals? Good question. The things that were not living things were burned along with the uh, sacrifice. And I hope I can uh, make this clear. Well, you might ask yourself and say, well, why was it, why was it only certain animals that were sacrificed, right? Um, where, again, it's kind of like give you real life examples. Where I come from, we have different tribes and different tribes have a list of unclean and clean animals. The unclean animals you can never touch. You don't touch because, again, for whatever reasons, it's considered cursed. So we would never eat a turtle. Um, uh, why have you never ate? A, how many of you guys have ate a turtle before? You might. You ate a turtle. Um, interesting. Uh, uh, but most people don't typically eat a turtle, right? We're, we're not judging. Uh, or many of you guys have never ate a snake, right? I've seen a skin snake one time, and I prayed for those kids who brought me the snake. Uh, but most of you will not say, oh, wow, well, that's a very good looking, scrumptious um, rattlesnake, right? In your mind, you kind of like cat categorize animals as nasty. You might say it's nasty, oh, it's gross, but it's kind of considering it unclean, right? And so where we come from, different people have different um, things that they consider unclean. Like when I grew up, we could never eat duck. Duck was considered unclean. What for some other people, it was okay. Uh, or turkey. But I eat turkey. Um, so <laughs> I never tell them. Um, <laughs> I, I think I've had duck before. So I would be considered a very unclean person in my tribe. Or even like eating like shrimp, all that stuff. Um, so what? What do they do? Long ago, you'd be shunned up sometimes to the point of being killed. Um, so it was a big deal. Uh, thank the Lord we don't do that no more. Uh, but. <laughs> In the sacrificable animals, the unclean animals were, were supposed to be avoided altogether, right? You can touch the unclean animals, not even just sacrifice them. If you touch an unclean animal, you'd be considered unclean. So God would not require the people to avoid unclean animals and then say, sacrifice unclean animals to me. That makes sense? Uh, but also the unclean animals, if an animal died by some random um, whatever reasons, Maybe it got injured, or maybe a snake bit the cow and it died, and you could not bring that and sacrifice it because the animal dying would make the animal unclean. That makes sense? The clean animals could be eaten and they could be sacrificed, but wait, no, 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 no. The clean animals could be ate, but there was also a list of very many clean animals, but only a specific few of them were considered sacrificable. Make sense? Yes. I'm trying to think of a clean animal that you could not sacrifice. Um, I think ducks were uh, clean, but you could not sacrifice a duck. It was not considered on the list of the animals that you could bring before God. <coughs> uh, there's many reasons for why that is. Uh, go look that up on yourself. Uh, but there were specific sacrifices that happened in the house of the Lord. Okay? 
specific sacrifices. We had one that was con was called the, the burnt offering. If you read through the Leviticus, you'll hear them say, offer a burnt offering, right? And then we had, um, let me write these down so you can stay with me. <clears throat> types, of, uh, types of sacrifices. You had the burnt, the burnt offering. Burnt would imply it was burned. Um, well, let's say whole burnt. Whole. A whole burnt offering. You had a peace offering. It's in the name. Um, you had a whole peace. Um, you had a sin offering. So what? Nothing. Yeah. Um, so, sin offering was specifically for sin. The burnt offering was, remember when I told you that they used to make, they would burn animals and the incense would kind of like float up into the heavens and God would be pleased by that. That would fall under the burnt offering. And then they had um, a guilt Guilt offering. And the difference between the sin offering and the guilt offering is one, you're repenting of a sin that you've done, and one is meant to um, make reparations. And then there was a meal offering, but I don't want to talk about the meal offering. Now, the whole burnt offering was, you can see this in Leviticus chapter 1, it's right in there at the beginning. Uh, it was offered every morning and every night, every evening. Remember that, every morning and every evening. A lot of Christians, uh, a lot of denominations, when it comes to pray, what do they say about praying? Pray at all times. But some of them will say, make sure your prayers are going up to God, both morning and evening. So prayer is a form of sacrifice. Because you go before God and you're asking for something and you're appeasing God and repenting of sin. Um, but the burnt offering, we, they, no, we, I wasn't there. They offered um, every time a one year male lamb. And it was offered at the tabernacle and at the temple later uh, when he was, um, that he was, uh, when he was built. And the difference between the burnt offering and the rest of these is that the whole animal was burnt the whole animal was killed and all of it was put on the altar and when it was put on the altar it was burned and uh, the priest did not take any portion of the animal all of it was burned uh, before the Lord and like I said yeah all, all uh, the whole thing was uh, set, uh, uh, given up to the Lord um, the 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 the, the um, Hebrew word for burnt offering is uh, Ola. And loosely translated, Ola means smoke or going up. You, you see that connections? It was supposed to go up to the Lord. Your prayers, when you pray, what do we imagine in our, in our minds? Prayers go up. Daniel one time said uh, he'd been praying for something for, for days and he got no answer. And then Later, an angel comes up to him and he tells him, I've been fighting with uh, uh, Satan or whatever demon up in the in, up in the air. And the well, the angel that was supposed to deliver his answer had been up in the whatever, cosmos or the skies fighting this demon before he brought the answer down to Daniel. And this is in Daniel. You can look that up. And so, uh, and if you remember what I told you guys about how they believed about heaven, heaven belonged up here. And so when they prayed, prayers went up. Or when they sacrificed, the smoke went up into past the the expanse of the waters into the heavens. And when you prayed and asked for something, then the answers would come down from heaven to the people. And then the one that most people like understand, the one that most people understand. Uh, before I get to that one, do you see a connection between a, a burnt offering and Jesus? You have to be. Leviticus and the Old Testament point to Christ in a lot of ways. If Jesus had sacrificed just an arm, what would be the implication of that? 
maybe just my arm would be saved. Right? It's, it's theologically argued that Christ had to die altogether, had to be offered up altogether in order to save the whole man. If Christ, Christ was both man and God, right? So if Christ at the cross, only, uh, there's people who have argued and said Christ appeared to be a man, but he was not a man because you cannot kill God. But if at the cross, Christ somehow turned into God, then we would say he did not sacrifice his human part. And if he did not sacrifice his human part, then the unsacrificed human part cannot save a human soul. That make any sense? So all together he had to be offered up as a sacrifice, whole being, soul, and body. And then the one that makes sense is the sin offering. Now the sin offering could be offered, my bad, the burnt offering was offered up by the, by the priests. Only the priests could uh, perform this. I could almost make the argument and say, well, who offered up Jesus to die? Who remembers? The Sanhedrin. Who sat on the Sanhedrin? The priests. That guy, every time I mention his name, I kind of sound like I'm saying a bad word. But Anas, the high priest, offered up Jesus and he said it's better for one man to die then. The whole place, uh, the, everybody else would die. If you, if you look through the Synoptic Gospels. So the high priests offered up Jesus on behalf of the people to die. And when Jesus go, got before the... Uh, the uh, Pilate, what did the high priest tell the people? The Pharisees and the high priest convinced everybody and said, tell Pilate to give us Barabbas and kill Jesus, right? But uh, the difference between the burnt offering and the sin offering, the sin offering was sacrificed by, was given by individuals or a congregation whenever they uh, sinned against the Lord. Leviticus 4 through 5, Leviticus 6, uh, you can read that. And the type of animal that was offered was a bull, was a she-goat, was a lamb, was a dove, was a pigeon. And uh, the y'all notice how they, they're different in, uh, in categories? Um, they almost go from like big to small. You have a, lamb, you have a cow. Let me just write it. Cow, you have a goat, you have a dove, right? One is bigger and more expensive than the other. So this, the sin offerings depended on the social ranking. That makes sense? So if the rich, the rich could afford the cows, the bulls. So they sacrificed the bulls. A widow, probably um, because they had a lower social standing and probably did not have access to a lot of money, they would offer a dove. So it was given according to what people could um, afford and when they brought the uh, animal the animal was killed before the altar okay it wasn't put on the altar it wasn't put it wasn't sacrificed on the altar it was brought before and the 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 neck would be slit and once the neck was slit they would collect the blood and the blood would be sprinkled around the altar and on the uh the altar had kind of like um uh, what what are this, those things called? The handles of the altar, and the so the priest. So what? The horns. The horns, yes. And so the person would sacrifice the animal in the vicinity of. It's been argued here. Some have said over here. Um, you would you would come and sacrifice your animal with the priests there, and the priests would get the blood, and with the blood, the priest, not the person, would sprinkle the blood around the the altar, and then they would smear the blood. On the horns of the altar but then the flesh of the animal would be cooked and eaten by the priests by the priests or it would be burned outside the camp and that would be if it was offered for the um, for the whole congregation are you following so far you see how very meticulous and well detailed it was there's a lot of similarities with even how we worship with how we pray it's very uh, rooted in the, uh, the scriptures, um, in the times of the uh, ancient times. So, with this ranking, anybody had access to the altar. Anybody had access to uh, an animal. But can we assume that everybody had, well, can we assume that everybody could afford a dove? Probably not, right? Chances are that somebody could not have a dove, right? 
Uh, I'm sure maybe, maybe pour rain and try to grab doves or whatever. Uh, but when people could not afford to do specific sacrifices for themselves, there was a time when the priests would offer a sin offering for the whole congregation. And usually how the sin offering was, uh, was done, the person would bring the animal. So let's think goat. You bring the animal, if that's the altar, you get down here, you put your hand on the animal's head. Symbolism. Um, there's many ways to think about it. You're thinking, oh, the animal is taking a place from my body, from my sin, for myself. Or I'm laying my sin upon the animal, right? It is that, what's that word, that fancy word we use for Jesus being the, the, we well, takes our place as the sacrifice instead of our scapegoat. The scape, the scapegoat is different. They would put the so with the scapegoat, the priest would put his hand on the animal, usually a goat, pray and lay all the sin of the congreg of the whole people upon this upon the animal, and then uh, the animal would run. You were not allowed to eat that animal. But for this one, you'd lay your hand on it. The individual people. Oh my gosh, I can't remember the name. Substitution. substitution yes, just being the substitution. So the animal would take your place. We know that early on, God says the life of a person or the life of an animal is in the blood. Literal words of the Lord. The blood of any animal or a person carries the life and identity of the person. So I bring my animal. I tra Maybe I stole. Um, I was corrupt and I stole money. I put my hand on the animal and I say, this animal is taking, you know, you say or whatever you're saying. It's taking my place. I repent of my sin. This is my sin offering. I slit the throat of the animal, drain the blood. The priest collects the blood, and he does that around the altar for my sin, and then I am forgiven. When the sin offering was offered for the people, so there's a difference. Individual sin offerings, the animal would be partitioned. And part of the animal would go to the priests because that was their allotment. That's what God said. They shall eat from the house of the Lord. And some of the animal would go to the sinner's family, right? But when the sin offering was offered on behalf of Israel, the animal was burnt, was sacrificed. They would drain the blood. So the priest would put the hands on the, on the cow or whatever and speak the sin of the nation upon the cow, slit its throat, drain the blood. The blood would again be sprinkled around the, the altar and its horns, but then the blood will be taken into, there's a, um, where is it? I think it's right here. That it's called the, um, the altar of incense. There was an altar here that constantly burned incense before the, before the ark, this is the ark of the covenant. And uh, so on the horns of the altar of incense, then the blood would be smeared on those horns. But because the animal died for the rest of the congregation, it would not be eaten. It would be burnt, kind of like the whole, whole burnt offering before God. Connections to Jesus? Do you, are you picking up some connections at all? There's lots. Lots. Jesus said, Take my body and eat, and then drink my blood. Both. He didn't just say my body. It was both body and and blood. Whole burnt offering of his body and his blood. His blood spilt as a sin offering, uh, sin offering for the nations. Right. And what happens when Jesus died on the cross? The temple curtains were split. Lots of. Uh, ways that we can connect this to Jesus. I'll carry on from this. I'll be concluded in, concluding this series next week. When you come to class next week, we I want to begin a bit early and finish it. We have another step in the whole ritualistic thing that I want to talk about. So you're free to go. God bless you.